let me introduce you to your presenters. Um, I'm not going to be speaking for much of the rest of this webinar. We've got experts here with us. Uh, but as I said, I'm Yolana, Assistant Registrar, Student Recruitment at King's. Neil, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Oh, unmute your mic. Hi, sorry about that. I'm still learning the ropes around here. Uh, I'm Neil Robertson. I'm the director of the Foundation Year Program. Uh, and also, uh, as we'll be uh, learning a little bit more about the Foundation Year Program, I'm the coordinator of the fourth section. Uh, and actually, along with every, all of the presenters, uh, I'm also a uh, alumnus of the Foundation Year Program. So I think that goes for all three of us. Roberta, would you like to introduce yourself? For sure. Hi, I'm Roberta Barker. I uh, teach in uh, theater studies and gender and women's studies at Dalhousie University. Um, next year, I'm also going to be the uh, acting dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Dal. Um, and I'm also, as Neil just said, an alumna of FIP, and uh, I'm going to be the coordinator for Section 5 of Foundation Year, the Age of Revolutions next year. Thank you very much. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Neil to uh, carry us through the first part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Yolana. So I'm just going to speak for a few minutes about the kind of basic uh, pedagogical structure, the way we learn in the Foundation Year Program. And there's really three ways that uh, we, in, we come to uh, the activity of learning in FIP in the Foundation Year Program. Uh, the first is through readings, the second is going to be lectures, and the third is tutorials. So I just want to talk about each of those uh, in a little bit of detail uh, to give you a sense of it. As you can see from this uh, slide, there are six sections to the Foundation Year Program, uh, and um, the FIP is an opportunity to encounter some really wonderful texts, uh, but we're also doing it in a historical context. Uh, so you're going on a kind of an odyssey or a journey as you go through the Foundation Program. We actually begin in the city of Ur, uh, in uh, the Sumerian world, uh, in what would be modern day Iraq, uh, and um, uh, move from those kind of initial uh, human foundations uh, right up to the contemporary world. Uh, and in a way, we are going to be moving from the city of Ur, and we end the section with actually the, with New York City uh, and London as well uh, in the final section in section six. Uh, and we'll encounter many things uh, in between. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to engage in a kind of reflection on where we have come from, where this contemporary world uh, comes from, at least uh, some of the crucial aspects uh, of it. Uh, so sometimes I'll say that what we're doing is we're like fish who are swimming in a certain water. We're coming to actually see that water that we're all swimming in this contemporary world uh, for the first time and all of the things that, uh, at least many of the things that have, uh, have brought it uh, about. Um, and in a way, this image of a journey, the books that we're going to be looking at are in a sense the stepping stones as we go through the program. Uh, and for many who do FIP, uh, it's an opportunity to discover some really wonderful texts that you want to stay uh, uh, and just sort of linger with. Uh, and there's opportunity to do that. Uh, but also there's a sense of um, getting that larger movement and the larger variety of uh, ways. So we're gonna be looking at works of literature. We're gonna be looking at works of philosophy. We're gonna be looking at theatrical uh, texts. Uh, we're going to be considering science and art and uh, politics. Uh, all of these things and more are a part of how the Foundation Program works. And it's an opportunity to encounter a whole series of different voices. Um, a number of these voices are kind of mainstays in the way that the Western tradition has come to express itself. But many others are new voices or voices from other traditions that are part of the way in which FIP thinks of its pedagogy as a kind of discovery of a series of encounters that characterize really the development to our own contemporary world, to the modern world, to the contemporary world. 
Um, and uh, so this is just a selection of some of the texts we'll have a chance uh, to look at. Um, and uh, you will be sent uh, in the fairly near future a reading list that'll give you the full panoply of the uh, works that we're going to be looking at over the course of the year. Uh, and one of the things I also want to say about the, the sense of readings is that when what we're really doing is kind of encountering uh, in both its constructive and wonderful aspects, but also its destructive and terrible aspects, this whole development. Uh, and I do want to give you that sense that this is very much a critical and reflective relationship to both this history and to these, these individual works. And I think, you know, um, Yelena has spoken about some of the issues that are before us right now. And it seems to me to be palpably clear that if we're going to get any handle on our own world, we need to see these issues as not the thing of a day. They have deep histories and, uh, and we need to look at that depth if we're going to have a thoughtful and reflective relationship to it. One of the other things that's important about this vision of reading uh, that is before you, this feast, I hope you're seeing it as, is that um, there's a kind of pedagogical principle that goes on in the way FIP works. You're not reading textbooks, you are reading the primary texts, the works written by individuals in those different historical contexts, in those different places and times. And that means that really there's no difference between me and you in terms of the evidence, the basis upon which we're going to be entering in discussion. You can come to an insight I've never had before or any of the other tutors or lecturers have ever had before. And that's the sense in which FIP is going to be new every single year. And we're all in a way on an equal playing field because we're all talking about the same thing that's before all of us. Um, and uh, so one of the, um, uh, why don't we move on to the next slide and that'll just give us a sense of the um, second way in which we engage in learning in the Foundation Year Program. And uh, that is uh, in terms of lectures. The, there's gonna be a lecture every, uh, um, every, there's gonna be a set of scheduled lectures, four for you every week. Uh, and they're an opportunity for you to hear not the final word, on any of these texts because all of these works are of such depth that there is really perhaps no final word, uh, but a kind of first word, an opportunity by somebody who's spent time uh, and, uh, uh, and a kind of perhaps love or interest in the work and they're able to bring their insight and understanding. And in a way also to kind of help each of us see how a reading of a work can be done in a thoughtful and reflective fashion. Uh, but again, by no means are, is it the case that you're simply supposed to accept this view. Uh, it is simply a kind of first offering to initiate your reflections and your considerations, which could well be in complete contrast uh, and disagreement with what you've heard. Um, so the lectures are, one of the wonderful things about the lecturers in the foundation program is you're going to have an opportunity to see far more lectures than a normal first year student would because the coordinators have brought together people from both the King's community and the Dalhousie community and beyond to come and lecture in fields that they know about. Uh, there is a whole variety and range of uh, people who are going to be there. Uh, as well as a coordinator who's providing a kind of cohesive sense of the section uh, as a whole. Uh, so they gain a variety, but also a sense of continuity and connection that will help you encounter these works. And one thing I just want to mention in passing is that uh, we're planning on Fridays, we have a thing called general tutorial, and that's entirely voluntary, but it's an opportunity to for you to have a conversation with the people who've lectured in that week. Um, so then why don't we move on to uh, the uh, next slide. 
uh, uh, Yolanda, that's great, thank you. So the tutorial. For me, and I think probably really for everybody uh, involved in the Foundation Year program, the beating heart of the whole program is in the tutorials. Um, and the tutorials are the opportunity for you to take what you've read, the lecture that you've heard, and make them your own, and engage in a reflective discussion with your fellow students in uh, an exploration of that material, that you're there to ask questions, raise matters that didn't make sense to you, also to challenge perhaps the lecturer or uh, engage in conversation with your fellow students, explore things. They're wonderful opportunities to engage in this kind of collective reading and collective thinking that I think is crucial to the whole way that FIP works, that there's a mind going on that's not simply our own personal minds that we are tapping into in some way in the tutorials. So it's a chance for free and respectful discussion and debate and questioning uh, in, in a group of your students with a tutor who is a full-time um, uh, faculty member. These are not uh, part-time uh, positions. Uh, they're not TAs uh, in any sort of way. Uh, and they've been uh, uh, specially selected and they're deeply gifted uh, teachers. Uh, the tutors comprise of the younger tutors who are called the fellows, uh, and then the older tutors, such as myself, I'm afraid, uh, the professors, uh, and all of us function as a team. And um, one of the things I want to talk about a little bit is that in the structuring of your year, we have, you're going to be, uh, you're, you're going to be with your tutorial group throughout the year, um, but, uh, where there's going to be some variety is that you'll have a different tutor for three of the six sections and the other three sections you're going to have your main tutor and they're interspersed so you'll be meeting your main tutor throughout the year and your main tutor will keep in touch with you watch your progress but then of course you'll also have the opportunity to, in, uh, to um, interact with uh, other tutors and so again have that combination of continuity and diversity that is so uh, crucial to the kind of rich experience uh, that we're hoping for you in the Foundation Year program. Um, and just a couple of other things to mention about your tutors. Uh, they are your great support. Uh, you'll be writing your uh, essays uh, and uh, developing your thoughts in relationship to your tutors. So they'll have office hours. Uh, and they'll be available to you online in various different ways. So uh, the tu your tutors are going to be a kind of crucial um, help, support, and guide through, for your whole education throughout the Foundation Year program. Um, so why don't we move on just to the next slide, if that would be okay, Yolanda, thank you. Um, so now we're into, you could call uh, where the rubber hits the road, uh, the essays and the exams. Now, one of the things, these are obviously the ways in which we assess you, uh, as well as tutorial attendance, which uh, is um, uh, part of your uh, assessment as well. Uh, uh, the essays and the exams. But I want you to think about these as not simply assessment tools. They're really, again, also part of your learning process because it's through essays and exams, and uh, I want to particularly emphasize essay writing here, that you're going to have an opportunity to, for instance, focus on a particular work, a uh, particular thinker, particular artist, uh, and engage with that material in a sustained way. And you're going to be writing 12 essays over the course of the foundation program. That's one every two weeks. And when you do something 12 times in a row in the sustained fashion, you get pretty good at it. Uh, so one of the things we pride ourselves on is the development that our students have in relationship to their essay writing skills, their ability to interpret and understand a text, and uh, their capacity to articulate their own thoughts and arguments. So for instance, we don't even ask essay questions 
even though we call them essay questions. All we provide you with is a quotation, a kind of carefully chosen quotation from a text and the word discuss. Uh, and so it's up to you to figure out what your approach is going to be to that provocative quotation. What uh, question are you going to derive from it? And then what answer, what argument are you going to develop from it? Uh, so again, what we're working on is that sense of you engaging with the material to make your own way through it in, con in the context of uh, this whole uh, program, uh, working, doing the same work together. And there's lots of support. So your tutors are, again, absolutely crucial to, your, to supporting you in your essay writing. As well, we also have a writing coach uh, to help you uh, in terms of some of the nuts and bolts of uh, writing your essays. Uh, and um, so that's the essays are a kind of crucial component. Uh, we will also have midterms, uh, and they're pretty straightforward. And you probably are basically familiar with uh, what these kind of midterms will be like. They're short answer questions, and their job is really to just uh, take a measurement of the fact that you've been keeping up with the work and uh, doing the readings and uh, and uh, uh, being involved uh, with the lectures. Um, and then the last uh, uh, moment here I particularly want to mention is the oral exams, which are a little bit unique uh, in the foundation program. And um, what they are is an opportunity at the end of each term for each student to meet with two of the faculty member involved in uh, faculty members involved in the foundation program to just have a conversation about what you have learned and your thoughts uh, about the material that you've been covering and thinking about. Uh, so those are really our three ways, the essays, the midterms and the orals uh, by which we are going to assess you. Uh, but they're also a way for you to shape your entire year and kind of bring all of the things you're doing to a certain kind of crystallization. Um, so why don't we just move on to uh, the next slide. So as you are all aware, um, this is a strange time we're in and we are uh, going to certainly be uh, completely online in the first term. Uh, we don't know for sure about how things are going to fall out in terms of the second term. We're just going to have to wait to see what conditions on the ground are, what, uh, what the health authorities permit. Uh, but the one point I do want to emphasize right at the beginning here, and that you can see at the bottom of this slide, is that online uh, um, access to the program and involvement in the program is going to be available throughout the entire year. Um, so just to explain some of the changes we've made in terms of online delivery in this time of COVID, as people have been calling it, uh, is that we're going to be having uh, the lectures pre-recorded, which means that uh, while they're going to be released on a schedule, they will be available for you to uh, look at as the time suits you. Um, though, of course, in preparation for your, um, um, your uh, tutorial session. Uh, so the lectures are going to be pre-recorded. There will be what people call asynchronous, uh, so not necessarily happening at the same time. What will be synchronous or happening at a predetermined time are going to be the tutorials. Uh, and they will be done live online uh, with a schedule of times that you can sign up for. Uh, uh, that uh, will allow you to have access uh, to the tutorials along with all the rest. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing to accommodate for this year is if you look back or if you remember the picture of um, a tutorial group that you saw there, we generally have the rule that the tutorial group should be no more than 15 students. Uh, and we're going to be going for smaller groups uh, this year for eight, maybe up to 10 students uh, in, uh, in tutorial sessions. Uh, and uh, the idea there is that with the smaller group, there's an opportunity for everybody to participate in this somewhat more cumbersome 
online process uh, and to ensure that everybody's voice can be heard and uh, and that the kind of attention uh, that uh, you uh, need is going to be available to you, not only in terms of the tutorials themselves, but also because you're going to be connected to a tutor at the time, also in terms of that tutor and the uh, and the tutor's uh, office hours and other ways uh, to connect with you. So one of the things I just want to um, emphasize as a whole is that the foundation year program wants you to succeed. It's a challenging program. It's a wonderfully aspirational, exhilarating program, but it's also a supportive program. It's a community that is in it together. And so there's lots of student support with your tutors, with the writing coach. We also have an associate director of student support. So uh, you should be confident that your individual needs and difficulties are also going to be something that's going to be absolutely at the front of our minds and something that we will address and accommodate uh, as fully as we are able to. So uh, I think that um, uh, just looking at my notes uh, brings me to an end of uh, what I have to say. So off to you, Yelena. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, I want to turn things over now to uh, Dr. Roberta Barker to talk a little bit about what happens beyond FIP. And in this case, beyond FIP can mean the elective that you choose to take alongside the foundation year program, uh, if you choose to take one, um, and also the types of things that you might do in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences during your second, third, and fourth years of your degree. So I'll leave it with you, Roberta. Great, thank you so much, Yoli. Uh, so one of the super cool things about King's that you know certainly I have a very strong memory of from my time as a student in FIP and afterwards, and also from my uh, couple of decades of working as a teacher, both at Dal and King's, is this close relationship between uh, King's and Dalhousie. When you decide to come to King's, for foundation year, you also gain access to all the options available to Dalhousie students and the supports available to Dalhousie students. Um, and uh, that means that during your year in FIP, you have the full array of uh, electives and courses that are available at Dal uh, that you can select from uh, to take for your fifth credit uh, in if you are choosing to do that in your in your uh, FIP year. And after completing FIP, you can also go on to take degree programs at Dalhousie or joint degree programs uh, at King's and Dal. So um, as you may know, as I'm sure lots of you have had a chance to have a look at and be already thinking about and have ideas about, um, Dalhousie offers a pretty full slate of arts and social science programs, which are all available to uh, King's students. And these include some of the really well-known subject areas like classics, English literature, philosophy, political science, uh, history, the full slate of languages, a very exciting slate of lang languages that you can select from, sociology, many, many well-known departments. We also have the uh, Fountain School of Performing Arts, uh, which offers a range of BA degrees in theater and in cinema and media studies, and also uh, BA or Bachelor of Music options in music. So if you're interested in performance um, or the study of performance, that's a great option for you. We also offer uh, a range of interdisciplinary programs where you can actually uh, create your program drawing on uh, uh, offerings from many uh, departments that are linked uh, by their um, uh, by their shared subject matter, such as, for instance, gender and women's studies or law, justice, and society, which is a very popular program with students who are thinking about going on into law, uh, Canadian studies, uh, European studies. We, are, we have some really exciting developing fields and extremely relevant to some of the issues that Yoli was mentioning uh, that, that we're all thinking about that are all really, really on our minds right now, um, such as uh, Black and African diaspora studies and Indigenous studies, which are very rapidly growing at uh, Dalhousie, which you uh, may well want to have a good look at. And we also have even more uh, new and fresh, we have some uh, certificates, uh, small clusters that you can study in fields like art history and visual culture, uh, medical humanities and dance and movement studies. So we have a real range of subjects that you can, uh, that you can check out, many, many options. Um, and King's has 
I think an, an especially close relationship to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Dalhousie. Uh, there's a lot of people teaching at Dalhousie who have studied at King's and uh, there's uh, a lot of the professors from arts and social sciences from Dalhousie who you will meet during your year in FIT because they lecture in the program. Like, for example, uh, the person you're looking at on this slide right now, Dr. Eli Diamond, who's coordinator of section one of uh, foundation year and who teaches in the department of classics. So that means you're going to get a really good sense of the subjects, the classes, the professors that you might want to uh, check out uh, in future years at Dalhousie. And Foundation Year is so well designed to prepare you for a range of upper level classes in arts and social sciences. It actually provides you, uh, as um, I'm sure many of you are aware, with the required six credit hours in arts uh, and six credit hours in social sciences that you're going to need for your to complete your BA degree. It fulfills the writing requirement for reasons that Neil just made very clear. All that writing you're going to be doing, your writing requirement is going to be well fulfilled. Um, uh, so that this means that you don't need to have any concern that taking foundation year will in any way put you behind or mean that you need to kind of take catch up classes, uh, that your degree is going to take longer than you might want it to because you're doing foundation year. On the contrary, foundation year is really, really preparing you well to go on and take uh, any degree that you may want to take. Um, on the flip side, the Faculty of Arts and Social Science classes can be a really terrific addition to your FIP year, uh, especially if you're looking for an elective for your, your fifth credit uh, during that year. Um, and you've got many options. I mean, we really recommend that you choose a class that excites you and perhaps complements what you're doing in foundation year. Maybe something that you think, oh, this is a subject that I love, but that I, I'm, I may not be getting a chance to cover in FIP. A good example is that a lot of foundation year students uh, consider taking a language uh, during their foundation year um, uh, to fulfill the language, the foreign language, the non-English language requirement uh, for the BA. Uh, and you can consider languages ranging from French, German, Russian, Spanish, Mandarin Chinese, Arabic, classical Greek and Latin. So you've got like a lot of options that you can uh, consider if you're interested in a language. Um, another thing you might want to do if you know you have your eye on a particular degree subject is to take a class that will give you a good first year grounding in that subject. Um, and an example we often use is the performing arts. For example, people who might be interested in taking uh, music, uh, especially performance in music, or who might be interested in doing a field like acting or costume studies in theater. Uh, we often, and oh, you can see some of our acting and uh, 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 costume uh, and set uh, students work in action here on the, the uh, slide that uh, Yolanda has just shown us. Thank you very much for flipping to that slide in such a timely fashion, uh, Yoli. Um, uh, so if you're interested in that, the, uh, one of those first year classes uh, in performing arts can be a great option for you uh, and, and often can, can give a good, good compliment to the kind of uh, studies that you're doing in foundation year. Or another great option is, for instance, a field like uh, sociology and social anthropology or international development studies, um, where you may have an interest in that field and FIP is giving you a great background to that and perhaps one of the first year classes in that field will allow you to kind of delve into some of the contemporary uh, material and theory in that particular field that will help to prep you uh, for, that, um, uh, for that area of study. Um, the one thing we, we don't really recommend is taking an additional writing intensive class at Dalhousie. Uh, we do offer lots of writing intensive classes in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, but as we just mentioned, FIP is very, very writing intensive. Uh, so, so we suggest that you, uh, you focus your writing intensiveness on, uh, on, on FIP and uh, look at if you're, if you're considering another class at Dalhousie. Um, uh, 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 courses that perhaps, again, offer a little bit of a, of a complement or another way of working. Um, if you're wondering about next steps at Dalhousie, whether that has to do with um, uh, what, what course you're going to select for next year or uh, possible degree options for the future, we greatly recommend talking to our student advisors at the Bissett Center um, at Dalhousie, who can, who can sit down with you and talk to you about your particular program with your wonderful, magnificent advisors at the Registrar's Office at uh, King's, like Yolana and her colleagues. 
um, or chatting with some of the Dalhousie profs who lecture at King's. Um, so the fact that we're going to be online for the first term next year, as Neil was just talking about, sh should not deter you from this. You know, um, we're really used to um, the pleasures of having students come down after lecture and just talk to us about, you know, I'm interested in this field. And exactly like that, you should feel extremely welcome to email any uh, lecturer that you uh, that you meet, uh, that you're listening to their lecture and you think that's interesting, I'd like to learn more about what you do. Um, they'll be very keen to Zoom with you or um, uh, get, get together with you on Skype or on the phone or via email to talk about their field options you can consider. Um, FIP students are, are very, very popular <laughs> at Dalhousie. They are beloved at Dalhousie. Uh, they're, uh, uh, graduates of Foundation Year are known for being very well prepared for upper level classes, uh, for being great writers, as Re Neil was just talking about, and also for their enthusiasm, intelligence, uh, so much, so much that they bring to classes. So you, you should be assured that when you are uh, taking classes at Dalhousie as well as classes at King's, you will be uh, embraced uh, uh, as part of uh, a community that is a shared community in both, uh, uh, both institutions, these sister institutions. And I think it's sometimes felt that Dow maybe looks a little large and overwhelming compared to the close knit uh, and supportive community at King's. But something good to know is that a huge majority of the departments in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences are actually quite small and have quite small and intimate classes uh, and tightly knit communities as well. Uh, so you will meet people and, and you will be welcomed into that shared intellectual community that goes across uh, Kings and Dalhousie. So, uh, the, the skills you're going to learn in FIP, the writing, careful and critical thinking skills, collaboration skills, communication skills are so transferable, not just to your upper level classes at Dal and Kings, but onward into the job market. Uh, we have so many graduates who are working in so many exciting fields. Um, uh, you know, from, from writers to doctors, uh, to uh, journalists, to poets, uh, to uh, musicians, public administrators, uh, people in so many fields uh, whose work is reflecting uh, what they've taken out of uh, Foundation Year and out of this close relationship between Kings and Dow. So we're really excited uh, to uh, see you at Dalhousie, looking forward to uh, working with you and getting to know you and uh, just as, as Yoli and, and Neil have been saying, we're very much available to answer any questions that you might have. Perfect. Thank you so much um, for all of that. I, I really want to just open it up now uh, for any questions that folks have. Um, you can type those right into the Q&A feature. Uh, and we, we've got plenty of time to, um, to be here and answer questions. I know that uh, Roberta needs to run right at five. So any questions that are maybe very specific to fast, we'll try to answer those first, but um, just to make sure she has time. And I'll stick around for as long as people want to keep asking questions um, to kind of move, move through them with you. Uh, okay, perfect. We have a first question here from Emma who wants to know, how will we be getting our textbooks and our used books already that you already have acceptable? Um, Neil, would you like to address how students access their FIP books? Sure. So uh, you're going to be sent a book list shortly, and it will have specific information about the particular editions that we're going to be using. Uh, and you can get those books anywhere. Uh, you're free to use other editions if you choose. It just makes life a little more challenging uh, because the lecturers might be referring to a page that uh, is for the edition that is uh, there in the book list. Um, you can get the books also uh, through our bookstore uh, and they're planning to uh, be able to mail out your books. You can actually get the entire year of books in a big bundle. Uh, so um, the uh, co-op bookstore, which is uh, uh, run by essentially the students or through a cooperative uh, is a tiny little bookstore. Uh, in the, the King's, um, in the basement of uh, one of the buildings at King's, and it will send your books uh, to you. Um, and so used books are uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, as I said, um, the, it's just easier uh, if you have the same edition as, the, um, uh, as are indicated in the book list, uh, but it will give you the precise information you need uh, to get the right edition. 
May I add a word of support for the King's Co-op Bookstore, uh, just because I'm very fond of them. It's a student-run business, and the manager, Paul, is a fantastic human being. Um, he spent his entire day on Monday delivering half-priced books about uh, race and racialized violence to people all over the city of Halifax on his bike, and now his back is sore, um, and that is a wonderful thing to do. But I, I also wanted to add that every day, every year, when we put out the Fit Book List, he adds up the numbers, and he compares what it would cost to buy your fit books through the independently run King's Cop bookstore uh, as compared to buying them through a major online book retailer mega corporation that has a name that I'm not going to say. Um, and I would like to reassure you that it is actually cheaper to buy them uh, supporting this independently run bookstore than it is to purchase them online through that mega corporation that is famous for abusing its employees. So it's great news. Um, there's a question here from Emma who wants to know if lectures are online, will students have access to a live session with lecturers where they can ask questions? Yes. So I was trying to uh, communicate that when I talked about general tutorials. Uh, so um, the uh, each week on uh, at Friday, because it's going to be a live session uh, at 3.30 to 4.30 Atlantic uh, Standard Time. Uh, we will be organizing the lecturers from each week to be available to uh, communicate uh, with people in, uh, in a session, uh, and you can ask your questions at that point. Um, and as Roberta uh, indicated, um, lecturers uh, are always open to having questions directed to them via email or some other means, uh, um, and everybody's email address at Kings and at Dalhousie is incredibly simple. It's just first name dot last name and either at dal.ca or at ukings.ca. So you can find all of us. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, and just to be clear, the lectures are pre recorded, but of course you can contact those lecturers or meet them at General Tutorial. And the tutorials are live and interactive so that there is obviously that, that, that regular opportunity for interaction. Um, another great question here from Miranda, since classes are online, will we be able to take DAO classes that once would have conflicted with the FIP morning lecture schedule? And I, I mean, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, yeah, yeah it, it, it completely depends on the class you're taking, but when you, um, when you register for your courses, you'll be able to see timetabling and how it works. Um, and it'll be clear what, which things are, um, synchronous where you need to be online at a, given, a specific time to access that class and which things are asynchronous and that you would you would access um, at the time that's convenient for you. But I think generally speaking, the online system kind of allows for quite a bit more flexibility with timetabling compared to the traditional style. Yes, and I know that one thing they're working on that we've been working on at Dalhousie has been to make really clear on the timetable and uh, this, this is just coming in right now. So you may want to keep your eye on the timetable um, as you're selecting and thinking about things. Um, uh, whether there's any going to be any synchronous component and in most cases that's going to be kind of an optional like for example a, a tutorial style or, a, or a, a, a discussion session that you can log into but you but may not be absolutely uh, required. So again that just opens up a little bit more uh, flexibility in terms of your choosing uh, classes. So yeah that's that's one nice offshoot. Um, one of the questions here is, could one of the electives that you take alongside FIP be from another King's course, specifically the King's Honors Program, so Early Modern Studies, Contemporary Studies, or History of Science and Technology? And if so, will these also be taught online? Um, Neil, would you like to address <laughs> EMSP, CSP, and HOST and how they relate to FIP? Sure. Um, so the those three programs are usually thought of as upper year programs. Uh, so the vast majority of students are in second, third, or fourth year. It's not simply impossible to take some of those classes. Uh, uh, and I'm just going to draw one crucial exception in all of this. Uh, but normally, they require uh, permission from the uh, instructor. But the crucial exception to that is that the history of science does have a first year uh, course or first year set of courses uh, an introduction to the history of science, which is specifically designed for first year students. 
counts as a science credit uh, and so can make very good sense to take alongside the foundation year program uh, in terms of um, getting a number of your requirements all sorted out in your first year. Um, and just to kind of further add to that, so uh, this was something that, that Roberta mentioned during her presentation, but as a Bachelor of Arts student working towards a Bachelor of Arts degree, there are a number of general degree requirements that need to be completed at some point during your BA. And many of these general degree requirements are um, completed just by doing FIP. So the writing requirement, the humanities, the social sciences, FIP covers all of those for you. So you don't need to think about when you're going to do them later in your degree. There are um, two other general degree requirements of arts that you should do at some point during your degree, whether it's in first year or later, and that would be your language requirement and a science, uh, a life sciences course. And this history of science and technology course that Dr. Robertson is talking about can fulfill that science credit for you. So I just always like to flag this, especially for students who um, I, are my kindred spirits. I know that when I left high school, I was not, uh, science was not my strongest subject. Um, and the idea of taking a science class at the university level made me nervous because I didn't really think I was gonna thrive in let's say a chemistry laboratory. Um, however, a course like History of Science and Technology fulfills your science credit and just as Dr. Robinson said, it's specifically designed for art students. So it's, uh, and it fits beautifully with the FIP curriculum. So that's a really good one to take. Um, uh, does it make a big difference in your degree if you choose not to take an elective during FIP is the next question we have here. So can you do FIP without taking an elective? Does anyone else want to field that one or I can take it? I can, I can talk to that a bit. I've known lots of students who've chosen to do that. Um, and I, I think that it doesn't, it's, it's not at all problematic uh, in terms of your overall degree. It means that you'll, at some point, you'll have to, and I'm sure Yolanda can say more about this and Neil as well, at some point you'll have to uh, uh, cover the full number. We used to say the 20 credits for your, uh, the 20 full credits for your uh, degree, the 120 credit hours if you're doing a four-year degree. Um, so that particular uh, six credit hours, if you don't take an elective while you're doing FIP, um, some people, for example, choose to do a summer class in the following uh, summer or to uh, 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 add on, you know, an extra, an extra term or, or an extra year. So there's many, many different arrays that you can take and, and, uh, and Yolani, you may want to say a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, you can definitely choose not to do an elective with FIP. And just to echo that, you can, you can make up that class later. It can happen in the summer. Uh, it can happen at another time in your degree. Um, not doing an elective alongside FIP, uh, there's really no reason why that would slow you down or um, stop you from graduating within four years or the amount of time that you want to spend in your degree. It is very common, and I think it will be increasingly common this year, because one of the real perks of the Foundation Year program, one of the ways that it has a huge advantage, is that it is one cohesive integrated program that gives you the bulk of what you need to complete a full course load. And so if you choose not to do that elective alongside, then uh, effectively you are taking one class, just one class that has one schedule, one timetable, one set of expectations to manage. And uh, I think that that can be a really reassuring thing, especially if you're feeling a little nervous about what online teaching will be like. And I don't wanna dissuade you from taking an elective because I think that's an awesome thing to do as well, but you can absolutely choose not to take one. Um, and that is just something which I would mention um, I, on the next slide that I'll show you, I've got the email address that you can use to reach our academic advisors, but I would recommend just mentioning that that's your plan uh, if you're talking to one of our academic advisors and they can help you think through uh, where you might make up that extra elective at a later date. Um, there's a question here that asks, will elective classes or DAO classes also have pre-recorded lectures or will they be uh, taught live or synchronously or, um, it, yeah. So the answer to that is uh, there will be some variety. I think that you are going to see lots and lots of the Dalhousie classes that are going to have pre-recorded lectures. I know lots of people are planning on uh, podcasting. 
um, sharing uh, lectures in all kinds of ways, uh, chat, um, but uh, many of them will also have a, uh, a live component. So I would say that what you're going to be seeing at Dalhousie is a range of, of different teaching methods that are going to sync to what the subject is. Obviously, for example, if you're doing a violin study, you're going to be Zooming with your violin teacher, to put it mildly, or, you know, uh, uh, not wanting to be advertising for Zoom. You're going to be doing some for, so, form of live <laughs> uh, study. But uh, uh, I, my guess is that in most cases, you're going to be seeing a mix that's similar to what is happening at uh, in foundation year. Um, some may be swinging more towards being largely recorded. Some may be swinging more towards being largely live. Uh, but probably most of them are going to have a mix. Um, I just wanted to mention, I'm watching the questions coming in on the q and I've noticed that a few people have questions about residents, and I just want to reassure you, if you ask me a question about residents, I will get around to answering it. I just want to make sure that um, we address the questions that are about foundation and program and about the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences before 5 p.m., while we still have uh, Roberta here with us. Um, because I know she needs to run off to another meeting, but just hang tight. If you ask me a residence question, I'm going to get to them. Um, one of our other questions here, which is a lovely open-ended question is what is your biggest piece of advice for FIP students? Uh, is that for me? Um, my biggest piece of advice is, uh, basically as Yolanda has indicated, we have a pretty structured uh, program and relax. Uh, it's going to work out uh, for everybody. Uh, and if you can get a little bit of the reading done in advance, that's fine and good. Uh, we usually recommend, for instance, that, for instance, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which has been our first reading for uh, I don't know how long, uh, that you might uh, take a look at that. Uh, but you don't need to uh, read ahead a whole lot. It all depends on your personality. Some people find that to be a helpful thing to do, and you're going to be getting the reading list shortly uh, if you want to go down that route. But um, really, the, the, the program is kind of uh, uh, pretty well organized, and uh, we've been doing it for a long time, and uh, um, the supports are all there in place. Um, and basically just enjoy would be my basic advice uh, and and wait till September and uh, it will it will happen it will be uh, a busy and lively uh, uh, event but uh, I wouldn't be you know I'd be relaxing the summer mainly or working or whatever you need to do <laughs> yeah. um Neil, this one's another one for you. Oh, pardon me. Uh, Ruth wants to know how long will a pre-recorded FIP lecture be? So our model is going to be to follow the basic constraints of a FIP lecture as they've always existed, which is two 50-minute halves. But the advice we have is that uh, that's probably a bit too much. So it's most likely that they're going to be divided up into smaller units, perhaps 25 minutes uh, but the goal would be to have something like a hundred minutes uh, of lecturing um, uh, and uh, which is something that people can manage because of course we've been doing it uh, for ages uh, and uh, so we're not uh, going to um, take advantage of the fact that it could be infinitely long uh, because we know that uh, your attention spans and your patience uh, are only going to be so long. Uh, of course, one of the advantage, huge advantages of the pre-recorded form is that it means that you can look at them at your own pace. And if somebody says something and you want to go back and find out, well, I didn't pick that up the first time, you can go back, right? So you're going to be in the driver's seat uh, in relationship to your reception of those lectures. But uh, the imagination is that they're essentially going to be the same as they would have been uh, if they were live in terms of the overall length um, uh, of the lectures themselves. Uh, another great question here is with regard to tutorial groups, do you stay with the same group of students for the year or do they get shuffled up? Great, yeah. So uh, what we do is um, have you with the same group of students uh, throughout the year. Uh, the idea there is that um, 
usually what happens is that the students form connections and develop their thinking together. This is often a place where uh, real friendships uh, get developed. Um, but it allows there to be a kind of continuity and memory in the tutorial group, uh, which is again part of the process that we're 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 covering a lot of material, but it does have a kind of continuity and interconnection to it, and to assist with that, having the tutorial group stay together is a huge uh, help uh, help in that. Um, uh, but of course, the, you will be having different tutors, as I mentioned before, uh, in uh, a certain kind of shape over the course of the year. Wonderful. Um, another question that's in here from Grace is, are there specific course requirements for certain programs in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences that we would need to take as our elective in first year? That's a great question, Grace. Uh, yes, there are some programs that have specific first year requirements that you either need to take while you're doing foundation year as your elective, or you need to um, plan sometimes, for example, students uh, uh, plan in advance to do their degree over five years in order to make it more possible uh, to uh, do it in a relaxed way. Uh, I've mentioned a couple of the examples, for instance, uh, some of the performing arts degrees. Uh, for instance, if you want to uh, go into uh, uh, acting or costume studies or technical theater in theater, you need to take the first year required uh, classes in those specific areas, for example, the intro to acting and performance or the intro to costume studies before you can go into the second year uh, classes. Um, and this is also true, for example, of certain, some of the social sciences, there are particular first year classes that uh, if you want to go on into the second year, you need to have those, uh, those classes under your belt. Many, many uh, of the programs, the first year requirements are covered by foundation year, that the foundation year actually stands as the equivalent for the first year required classes. So in many, many cases, uh, there, there aren't specific classes that you absolutely need to take. But for instance, another great example would be if you're looking at going into a language, if you want to do a degree in one of the languages, uh, and you want to go into the second year classes in your second year, you want to do the first year of that language in your first year, unless, of course, you already have uh, credits in that language, transfer credits or advanced credits in that language due to previous uh, study. So uh, what I would recommend is is that is a great topic to sit down with an advisor, whether it's one of the advisors at King's or one of the advisors at uh, Dalhousie or both, and just go over uh, if there's a particular program that you're interested in and you're not quite sure about that, uh, that is a terrific question to ask specifically uh, to make sure, uh, or by email, to make sure that you know what courses you need to have to go on and, and do the next ones. That answer provided a really helpful transition into uh, two of the other questions that are in the, the feed right now. Um, Sadie asked about transferring tra credits from the IB program, the International Baccalaureate program, and Evan asked about transferring AP credits. So uh, I'll just speak to this briefly. If you went to a high school where you did the IB curriculum, the IB program, and you took higher level HL courses and got a five, six, or seven as your score in uh, that HL exam, then you probably have a transfer credit available to you. And if you went to a high school that has the AP, Advanced Placement pro uh, Program, and you did an AP exam and got a score of a four or five, then you probably also have a transfer credit available to you. Um, and those transfer credits can be very useful to you in your degree in many, many ways. So let's say you're planning to do FIP and you have room in your schedule for an elective, well, that transfer credit could function as your elective, and you might not do an elective alongside FIP. Or it could be the case that that elective allows you to move into a second year level course that you're doing alongside FIP. So maybe you took uh, IB higher level French or AP French, and you want to take a second year level French class. Well, that's great because you already have the equivalent of a first year level French class. So um, you can for yourself, for your, the benefit of yourself, research in advance the IP or the IB or AP credits available to you. Uh, you can you can Google dal.ca slash IB uh, or look up AP transfer credits on Dal's website. Kings and Dal use the same transfer credit equivalencies. You can put in the course that you took uh, and see what that equivalent, what the equivalent of that is uh, through Dalhousie and Kings. Um, but you can also talk about that with an academic advisor. 
Uh, if you did an IB or AP program, then, you're, uh, then you, your transcript is with the transfer credit union. They're a unit, the transfer credit unit, and they're making an assessment of that. So you'll also find out that way. But there are just lots of a myriad of ways that your transfer credits can be useful to you in your degree. Um, and that's definitely a conversation to have in more depth with an academic advisor uh, so that you can use those transfer credits in a way that aligns well with your academic goals. Um, perfect. Okay. As I said, I'm seeing a lot of residence questions here. I do want to address them. I just want to make sure we get the kind of academic. Oh, uh, here's one from Aaron. Is there an expected or minimum length for a fifth essay? Okay. Um, the FIP essays will have uh, the word count on them. Uh, I think it's usually 1,250 to 1,500 words. Uh, so usually about six pages, five, six, seven pages, depending on your font size. Um, and uh, your, um, so your essay needs to fall within that uh, limit. So it's not a huge long essay, uh, but also it shouldn't just be a page or two long. Uh, so um, there's a, and again, we'll have lots of people to support you in your essay writing. Um, great. Uh, I'm seeing a few more that I want to make sure we answer um, before Robert has to leave. Um, I'm just sorry, this Q&A thing is not that easy to navigate. Oh, um, there's a question here about academic accommodations um, for, uh, you know, health, uh, other related reasons to that. Can, would one of you like to speak to the academic accommodations process and how that works? Neil, do you want to say a bit about uh, Kings and I can say a bit about Dell and their interrelation? Okay. Yeah, so uh, basically, FIP relies on Dalhousie. Uh, so um, if you uh, have a uh, accommodation, uh, concern, then uh, the best thing to do is you can contact the foundation, your program office. But what we will be doing is forwarding uh, your concern to Dalhousie, which has the professional uh, capacity to assess it. And then we'll act on the basis of the assessment that gets forwarded to us in terms of working out the appropriate accommodation. Um, Roberta? Yeah, so at, at Dalhousie, we have a uh, very extensive student accessibility services whose goal is to make sure that the program is set up for you so that you will succeed and so that your needs are accommodated. So uh, they, they have a full procedure for um, uh, assessing your needs, working with anyone you maybe have already been working with, uh, touching base, uh, working with you. Uh, and then uh, once a program, you know, uh, has been set up that reflects, uh, that, that, that outlines the accommodations that you need. Uh, they will get in touch themselves with your professors, outlining the accommodations that are needed. Um, and that can be all kinds of uh, different aspects, whether that's specific uh, things that you need in the classroom, uh, uh, specific supports that you need, whether it's more time for particular uh, assignments uh, or, or specific setups for exams. There's, there's many, many options uh, uh, that they uh, can help you out with. So uh, uh, the procedure that Neil's outlined where you're gonna get in touch with FIP to let them know that, that's, that, that you uh, wanna set that process in motion, they can get you in touch with Student Accessibility Services at Dalhousie and, uh, and get that all underway. And it's, it's great to hear folks asking that question uh, now in June uh, because it's excellent to get that process started as early as possible so that everything's all well set up with you uh, for you and your and your professors know what you need uh, as the year starts and if I could just underline on the basis of experience if you have an accommodation concern please please raise it because um, we want you to succeed uh, it's always much more of a challenge to find out about issues further down the road uh, when um, things that might have been done haven't been able to be done. Uh, so please raise these issues as soon as possible because we really just want to make things work for you. Um, it's uh, it's 5.03 and I know that uh, Roberta, you have another meeting at five and um, I just, I. I just want to let you know, I, you're being very, very helpful with all of these questions, but if you need to log off, I, I'll stick around and keep on fielding questions. I've, um, I've just received the link to, the, to my next meeting, but, um, but I know that they won't mind if, if there's one or two more questions that I can help with before I log off and then I'll, I'll go if there's anything else that's uh, yeah. 
The last one here that I think maybe it would be great to have you weigh on is, is uh, this question. After completing FIP, if I decide to major and minor at Dow, will I still be considered a King student in my second, third, and fourth years? That's a great question. Yes, you absolutely will. That is completely the case. Uh, you will still be a King student, even if you are taking, and I can speak from experience because I was a King student who did a combined honors degree in English and classics, and uh, I remained absolutely a King student. You are still involved with all the King's uh, uh, societies, the King's, the many, many aspects of the social life at King's, and your your degree will will be from King's. Uh, you will graduate at the King's and senior. It will actually, in fact, be a jointly conferred degree by King's and Dow. Um, so you remain a King student. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Roberta. I, I'm going to re release you to your next meeting, but I'll, I'll still be online. I know there's still questions I haven't answered in the Q&A, and uh, I don't, Dr. Robertson, can you also stick around for a little while? or you stay, stay around for a little bit, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Great. So just, just wanted to say thank you, everyone. It's, it's great to meet you virtually. And um, if you've got any questions that, might be, that I might be able to help with that, um, that we didn't get a chance to talk about today, uh, as Neil mentioned, it's really easy to figure out our email addresses. It's just uh, roberta.barker at dial.ca, and you'd be super wel welcome to, uh, to drop me an email. Thank you. Okay. So Thanks, everybody. See you later. Okay. I think maybe I should um, address the, the, the number of questions. There's quite a few questions in here about um, what's going on with King's residences. So I just want to touch on those because I know people have been waiting patiently for an answer. Um, so one thing to be aware of is that on Friday, um, so just a few days ago, the Dean of Students at King's, who is uh, our, our wonderful Dean, Katie Merwin, um, put a statement out by email. So hopefully that's in your email inbox. If you haven't seen it, um, uh, please double check in your junk mail folder. But also, you know, if you're not getting emails from King's, it's, it's vital that you let me know so that I can look into it because we are emailing important announcements. However, the, the message that Katie sent out um, is also posted on our website. Uh, and I can, uh, I'm going to email everyone after this session. I'll include a link to that statement. Basically what the statement says is we do not know for sure yet how exactly residences will reopen, but we are working on our safety plan to ensure that they can reopen safely. And we uh, anticipate that we will be able to welcome um, some students onto our residences this year. Um, if you have not yet applied for residence and you want to be considered um, for a residence room, you should apply and you should do it as soon as possible. If you do apply to residence and you pay all the fees associated with that, there's a $400 confirmation deposit to hold your residence room. If, if you do all of that and then we are not able to offer you a room in residence, um, we will uh, just take that $400 fee and credit it towards your tuition so that it's actually useful to you um, and, uh, and isn't just money that is going nowhere. Um, so those are important considerations. Um, it, residence reopening is one of the, the most complicated aspects of adjusting our university to an online model. And I understand that it is frustrating to be waiting. Um, another question related to residents that a few people have been asking is what about relocating to Halifax and living off campus? And I will say that is, that is definitely an option. If you want to look into um, apartments and rentals and things like that in the city of Halifax that are off campus, we would of course encourage you to, to look into those options and see what's out there. Um, there are certainly some benefits to being, um, but, well, actually I won't say that. There's lots of reasons that it's, very, very accessible to do foundation year program online from your home. But if it feels important to you to be closer to campus, uh, and that's an option that you want to explore, by all means, you should do that. Um, I will also say that if you have specific questions about the residence process, the email address to reach the residence office is residence at ukings.ca. Um, they are fielding all sorts of questions like these from students right now. So I know that hasn't you know, fully answered the question. A statement was released. It was released on Friday. Is it a statement that fully addresses the question about how residences will reopen? No, not yet. Um, that is a process that we're working on you know, in close partnership with uh, public health authorities in Nova Scotia. Um, so I'm going to kind of move through some of the questions that um, are not related to residents, but I can continue to speak to that. 
Um, oh, someone also asked if, if you don't get into residence, how do you go about finding apartments? Um, I also just want to mention that on DAL's website, if you search um, DAL and off-campus housing, there's a really great page of resources through DAL's website that Kings and DAL students can access all about looking for housing in Halifax that's off campus. So information about how tenancy and renting works in this city. And that's a really helpful resource as well. Um, that's totally worth checking out. Okay, so sorry, I'm just trying to organize my uh, list of questions here so that I'm not missing anything vital. Um, Oh, this is a fantastic question that I almost missed. Will there be any opportunity to meet and engage with FIP students who are not in uh, the same tutorial group? Uh, well, I think, of course, there's all sorts of ways uh, for that to happen. Um, the one is going to be through our general tutorials. Uh, the other is that, um, again, I haven't thought through all these details. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that we're already creating, uh, um, and I think, Yolana, you have information on this, uh, things that the students themselves are organizing in terms of social media to be able to connect in all sorts of different ways. And uh, King's is uh, maybe primarily about academics, but there's lots of other ways, other things that King's does in terms of teams, uh, and uh, athletics in terms of societies, uh, in terms of music, uh, and uh, those other extracurricular uh, uh, fora, uh, even though they'll be functioning online, will be other ways to uh, connect uh, with, uh, with students. But uh, Yolanda, you might have some more. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of learning that happens outside of a classroom that happens just in the process of connecting uh, with people. And one of the things we're really proud of at King's is that our clubs and societies and groups on campus are student led and student run. Uh, and so that means that all of those amazing students who take those leadership roles um, in those clubs and societies, those amazing students are in the process now of figuring out how do I take all this fun and this great like extracurricular stuff that I'm responsible for and make it available to students um, online. So those are, are all questions that are being sorted out. But I do want to highlight um, just a few things that I think are really neat. Uh, so I've got some slides here with information about course registration. I'll talk to that, I'll speak to that a little bit more. My email address is on there if you have questions. But the thing I really want to highlight is that a group of incoming um, King stu students, and I, I don't know who these students are, They're, they were anonymous to me, but um, some amazing students out there started Facebook groups and Instagram groups for your year at King's, for the people who are starting in 2020 and uh, who are the graduating class of 2024. And if you want to find them uh, on Facebook, you're going to search for University of King's College 2024. You can find them on Instagram at UKings2024. Um, you can start getting to know your future classmates. I just adore that group. I think it's awesome that people are sending each other pictures and profiles and talking to each other. Um, so I definitely encourage you, uh, if you, if you are uh, not already following those groups, to, to do it. Um, so uh, there's a question here about, can I summarize what course registration will look like? Uh, yes, I can. Course registration begins on June 15th. Um, if you haven't already set up your university accounts, that's your kind of official um, student email address, an email address that ends with at dal.ca instead of ending with at Gmail or at Hotmail or whatever. Um, you should do that. There are instructions for how to do that uh, that you can find on our website and that have been emailed to you. Um, when you log in for course registration, there's a, a pretty clear step-by-step -step process. And we also uh, send, we have sent already, our academic services team has sent um, the links to our video tutorials that walk you through it step-by-step. -step. So if you have any questions about how the, uh, process works for registering for classes um, that haven't been addressed by those uh, helpful emails and tutorials that we've sent out already, um, I would definitely encourage you to contact our academic services team and their email address, which is up on the slide right now, is registrar at ukings.ca. So if you email registrar at ukings.ca, that'll put you directly in touch with an academic advisor who can talk you through the registration process, give you more information about how it works, the key thing to remember is it 
starts on June 15th. That's the first day that you can register. It can also, doesn't have to be right on that day, but that's the, the general uh, start time for it. Um, will the King's Bookstore have the, the books that are read in FIP available as soon as the book list is released is one of the questions here from Miranda. Uh, the, I, you, can, you will be able to order, I mean, I think you can order them now to, to tell you the truth, uh, but, but yes, they, they'll be available to order um, right away. And as soon, if you, they aren't already in stock, then when they are in stock, they'll be shipped to you. They'll certainly all be available before the start of the academic year. You'll, you'll get them well in advance uh, from the bookstore. Uh, when we're signing up for courses, do we still have the option to choose our tutorial times? Was one of the questions from here. Do you want to address that one, Neil? Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, there's a little bit of a first come first serve basis to this uh, because the tutorials are of a certain size and they can fill up. Um, but um, uh, all those times will be available for you. And so it's uh, just encourage you to register as soon as you can and uh, sign up to the tutorial time that works best for you. Um, yeah. Um, there was one student who uh, used the raise hand feature um, to kind of identify that they have a question and I wonder if, I, I hope I'm not putting the student on the spot, but what I can do is just uh, unmute their microphone. So if you're that, uh, hang on, we're, uh, let me see if I can figure out how to do this so that, uh, yeah. Hi, um, <laughs> hi McKenna, I, you did the raise your hand thing. So I've unmuted your mic um, or a made it possible for you to ask a question. Would you like to do that? It's still muted to me. Oh, yeah. You may have to- That was a mistake. Okay. Sorry about that for putting you on the spot there. Um, but I do see that there was one other student uh, who raised their hand and now I'm trying to figure out how I can see that. And I apologize to you all for being clearly- Oh, that, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. Never mind. Um, and uh, sorry, folks. Um, okay. A few more questions that are in the Q and A feature here that I can um, address. So uh, there's a student who asks if you're feeling trepidatious about online learning. A student who struggles with online learning. Is it possible to defer foundation year program for next year? but to take electives through Kings and Dow. So this is a great question. Um, it has a, a little bit of a technical answer. Um, when we use the term defer uh, in the registrar's office, that usually means that you are taking the whole package of what Kings has to offer and putting that on hold for a year and then starting up as a student the following year. So if you tell us that you'd like to defer, the way that we're going to understand what that means is that we're going to assume that you're not taking any classes through Kings and Dow, uh, but that you're starting in September of 2021. However, that's not exactly what you're asking about. Um, instead, what you're asking is, uh, could I start as a Kings and Dow student, but instead of starting in the foundation year program, could I start as a general art student and take a few other classes uh, through Dalhousie um, for this year online, and then switch into the foundation year program uh, at that point? Um, and that is possible. What you're describing, it is, a, it is an option that exists. It's a bit of a complex option. It's an option that I would strongly advise that you talk to an academic advisor about, because if you do take that option, it may add additional time to your degree. Um, and so that is an important factor that you should consider. I will say that the way that Foundation Your Program is structured, because it has that very uh, cohesive structure, I actually think that it will translate quite well to online learning. Um, and so if you are feeling a little bit trepidatious about what online learning would be like, I actually think FIP uh, has a lot to offer in this area because it's so coordinated. But there are also, you know, there, I'm sure there are students out there that are considering this option of potentially taking um, their elective classes uh, through Dalhousie and King's starting their degree as an undeclared art student or an undeclared science student, and then doing the foundation program in 2021. So if that's an option that you seriously want to consider and seriously want to approach uh, talking about, I would deeply recommend having that conversation with an academic advisor. Um, 
Oh, uh, this one is for you, Neil. Do you have any advice about what sort of technology like laptops or tablets would be the best option for a typical Kings or Dow student? That is not a good question for me. Uh, the answer is really anything. It's if it has a word processor and it functions, you can write an essay on it. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, in terms of um, the online portion, uh, obviously uh, having the capacity to use these online media uh, is going to be crucial, but um, uh, I, I am the least technologically savvy person that you can imagine. I just rely on following other people's advice, so I'm in no position to give you any. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I just should stop there. Okay. Um, the, the answer to the question about what tech you need is a, com a computer that functions. If your computer works to tune into this webinar right now and you can write um, a Word document on it or an essay on it, and uh, you, you will be fine. Yeah. Um, there is a question here about the likelihood that libraries, libraries at Kings and Dow will be open this fall. Um, um, I can't speak to that in a, a concrete way, but I think the likelihood that libraries will be uh, open uh, is very high, um, providing that our libraries can follow, you know, appropriate social distancing measures. But more importantly, a library is not just a physical space, it's a set of services and resources and those are available to you right now. So, um, you know, our library has many, many wonderful books in it, including um, several uh, thousand rare volumes of incredibly unique and interesting texts um, that are held in our uh, treasure room and archive underneath the library. And those, of course, are certainly worth seeing in person when we can finally open up our campus again. But our library also houses a huge collection of digital resources that we share uh, with the libraries at Dalhousie and actually, in fact, with uh, university libraries all across Nova Scotia. There's a shared system of, of resources called NovaNet that connects all of the institutional libraries across Nova Scotia and the resources that they offer are available to access online, like digital journals, for example. Um, also, the help and support that librarians can offer, the service and advice that they can give uh, in helping you learn great research skills, for instance, those are things that can be available online, even if the physical building is not accessible to you. So there's a lot of, I mean, heck, I could talk for hours about how great libraries are, uh, but uh, there's, there's lots of ways that libraries are open right now um, and will be accessible to students throughout the year. Yelena, if I could just step in. Uh, one of the things to mention in relationship to the foundation year program is that we do have two essays, uh, one in the first, at the end of the first term and one at the end of the year. Uh, that have a research component involved in them. But the vast majority of our essays, uh, while you are welcome to make use of secondary literature, uh, we are not uh, requiring it and it does not um, increase the value of your essay. Uh, so it's gonna be much more about you uh, in relationship to that primary material. Uh, so um, from that perspective, uh, the, the uh, being in person in terms of library access may not be a, a huge issue. That's a great point. Um, there's a question here about when does course tutorial or course sign up happen? And the answer to that is on the slide in front of you, course registration opens on June 15th uh, for all your courses, including your FIP tutorial. Um, someone asks how we'll submit essays online. Uh, is there a program like Google Classroom? Is this something that's already been determined by the Foundation Year Program teaching staff, the exact process for submitting essays, or is that well, something that you're... Yeah, so we will be using uh, Brightspace, which is the Dalhousie um, learning uh, system, uh, uh, and we've used it in the past. Uh, students have always, well, not always, but uh, in recent memory, students have, have been submitting electronically as well as a paper copy, but this time it'll just be an electronic version. Uh, and so um, that's up and running. It's that, that uh, and you'll be given uh, a tutorial on that uh, to explain how to go about doing that. It's completely straightforward. Perfect. Um, one of the questions here is, can we take our language course in January instead of in fall to get a language credit? 
Um, and the answer to that question depends a little bit on which language you're interested in taking. Um, I will note that many of the first year level language courses are offered as a full year course. So they happen in both the fall and winter term. Um, so again, a great question to check in with an academic advisor about. You can talk to an academic advisor about which language interests you, uh, and they would probably be able to point you to whether or not that is a course that's available separately in the fall and winter terms, or if it's a full year offering. Um, there are maybe three uh, questions here that I'll try to address all at once about what it means to defer and the process of deferral, if that's something that you'd like to do. Um, deferring your admission to King's is pretty straightforward. Uh, there's two steps that you would need to take. One of those steps is paying your admission deposit of $200, and that will hold a spot for you in the class of the, the, the cohort that starts in 2021. Um, so whether you plan to start foundation program this year or defer your offer admission, it is important to pay that admission deposit in order to hold a place for you in the program. So that's step one. Uh, step two is you email us. Uh, you can email admissions at ukings.ca um, uh, and you just let us know, hello, I'd like to defer. That's, that's really it. You might include a sentence or two about why you plan to defer, um, just so that we have that information. That allows us to have a little paper trail of it. Uh, it's important that you send that email from your own email address. So this is a little note for all the parents and guardians out there. I know there's a lot of parents listening right now. You cannot defer on behalf of your child, uh, your student. Um, the student should do that themselves. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, if you defer your offer of admission to Kings, and then take courses, uh, either online courses or in-person courses from another higher ed institution, another university, um, then you're really no longer a deferred student. Uh, in that case, you would have to reapply to King's as a transfer student. Um, so let's say you're someone in Toronto right now and you plan to defer your offer of admission to King's but take some classes online th through uh, U of T. Um, you would then need to reapply to King's and provide your transcript from U of T so that we can assess your most recent academic experience and provide transfer credits uh, where appropriate. So that's just one kind of important piece of the, the deferral puzzle is that it does uh, prohibit you from being able to take um, other higher ed classes without reapplying. I hope that was clear. If there's any questions about it, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, one more. How are, how are you doing, uh, Neil? Do you need to head out soon? I realize it's a little bit after. In a couple of minutes, yeah. Um, there's a question here about if there are plans to do in-person tutorials um, come second semester, so in the winter semester. Right. So, uh, again, we're going to be trying to sort these things out as the facts on the ground uh, clarify themselves um, in terms of you know, what's allowed. Uh, and one of the struggles we are going to be engaging with is if we need to be doing, uh, you know, if we've got a tutorial group uh, and there's some capacity for some people to be uh, coming in person, how do we get the tutorial to work also with those who are online? Uh, and um, so we're going to be making every effort we can because we know how valuable uh, the in-person um, experience is. Uh, but we have to keep in mind everybody who is uh, involved in, uh, in that process and making sure that it happens in a uh, appropriate fashion. So um, I really would love to have that happen. Uh, and I would love the conditions to be that uh, we can have it for as many as possible. Uh, but we're going to have to um, really uh, adapt uh, so everybody can be assured that that um, uh, principle of online availability is there throughout the year, uh, and then we will make the accommodations as they become available to us, knowing just how important that in-person experience is. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if this helps at all, because this is one of those situations where we have a, a murky crystal ball in front of us. We aren't going to be able to predict exactly what will happen. But I can tell you one thing that definitely will not happen. One thing that definitely will not happen is we won't hit the point where it's the start of winter term. It's like January 8th. 
And all of a sudden we've decided to flip the switch and we switch entirely from online to in-person and everyone has to scramble to get to campus as quickly as possible so that they can start learning. That is like, I can guarantee you that that will not happen. Um, this is going to be a process of gradual change and, uh, and something that allows us to introduce um, not the end of online learning, but the hybridization, the, the blending of online and in-person offerings uh, as it becomes safe and appropriate to do that. There's uh, just a few other questions that are kind of related to campus life. Um, Frosh week activities and meet and greets to get to know people and how those will work. Um, those are great questions. Frosh week at King's is entirely student led. It's run by our King student union, our student government, and they are working on their plans for orientation. Um, so they, there will be more information coming out uh, for our, uh, our virtual orientation programs. Um, all of that fun stuff, the extracurriculars, the ways that students get to know each other. And I will say again that if you want to get started now, um, getting to know each other, the student run social media accounts that are up on the screen are a great place to get started. Um, the other few questions that I have remaining in here, one person asked if it's better to live in residence or at home. This is a very personal question. It depends a lot on your personal circumstances. I don't think that I can fairly answer it here. Um, but, you know, do stay in touch with us about what decisions are being made around residence. Um, that may help you to make this decision. The important thing is uh, the online learning will be as accessible um, w regardless of where you are. That's, that's the whole point of online learning. So if you are at home, um, you will still be able to access all of the resources, the academic and the, and the other types of resources, support resources that the university offers. So you, so um, you, Yolanda, I think uh, I'm going to slip away now if that's all right. right. Yeah, uh, I see that all the questions right now are residence oriented and yeah. uh, you're in a better position to answer those than I am. So Perfect. I'm going to say uh, thank you everybody for coming and uh, uh, please uh, stay in contact with the Foundation Your Program office uh, and uh, with uh, Kings and we will um, sort out all your needs and all your questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Neil. Have a great evening. Bye bye. So the last few questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A here are also about residents. Um, one of them is how will we be deciding which people get access to residence rooms if we're not able to open all of them? Um, so again, this is a decision that will be made by the Dean of Students um, and will be really carefully thought out in order to figure out what's the most fair and appropriate for our students. I don't have the concrete answer to it yet, but I will say that if you uh, are at home and your home uh, has barriers that will make it hard for you to learn online. So for example, if you live in an area where you do not have access to reliable high-speed internet, for example, that is relevant information that you should share with the residence office. You could email residents at ukings.ca and let them know that that is a circumstance that you're facing. And I, I really, really hope that um, all of you are in safe and secure home situations. But I mean, just being a realist, I know that isn't always the case. If you do not live in a safe or secure home situation, um, again, please tell our residence office that. That is really important information that we would like to know. Uh, if you're a student with an accessibility need that's being set up through our accessibility center, and that accessibility need is going to make it very difficult for you to learn online from home, then again, that's really relevant information that we would like to know. Um, so any and all of those types of concerns should be addressed to the residence office. Residence at ukings.ca is the email address for them. Um, we have a question here about if residence rooms will be single occupancy or if double rooms will still be assigned. Again, uh, answering that question is part of the overall residence safety plan um, that's being considered very thoroughly uh, I think there is a, a good chance that we will have fewer um, double occupancy rooms available. Uh, and then another question that we have in the chat box here is, if students are able to come to residence while online classes uh, resume, will students be able to meet with any staff on campus while keeping a safe distance? Uh, yes, that is our hope that we would be able to do that. Um, so right now, the university's action plan for reopening 
involves getting uh, the staff and faculty back on campus and into our offices um, as, as soon as possible and then be able to welcome our students back uh, as soon as it's safe to do so. And so if you are on campus or near campus, um, our hope is that there will be services that are happening on campus that happen face to face. So just to use um, one example, if what you're doing is making an, academic, uh, an appointment with an academic advisor, there's a very good chance that you'd be able to make that appointment um, either to speak with them in person while keeping a safe distance from them um, or to make that appo appointment so that it happens online. Um, and the whole point is that everything is really accessible to everyone, whether they're learning um, on campus or learning off campus. Uh, another great question that's just come into the chat box here is if FIP students are not living on campus in first year, might they have the opportunity to live on campus, uh, live in residence for year two? And the answer to that one is yes, absolutely. King students, um, many King students who are first years choose to live on campus. However, we also have upper year students, second, third, and fourth years who live in campus. Um, traditionally at King's, one of the, the bays, one of the residence buildings, which is called North Pole Bay, has uh, historically been reserved for upper year students. And it's a lovely residence. It's one of our most recently renovated residences. Uh, it's filled with single rooms and it has a lovely kitchenette. Um, so if you are not going to be living in residence this year, uh, that does not mean that your opportunity to live in residence has disappeared. There's going to potentially be all sorts of times later in your degree as a second year or a third year or a fourth year where you might choose to come and live with us on campus. Um, and uh, that's definitely an option that's available.